would love to encourage you all to place into the chat some of your favorite parts of the conference. I would love to see those and we can talk about those a little later. I am Genevieve Jones Wright. I've been serving as the mistress of ceremonies, or should I say MC in this case stands for mistress of the conference. <laughs> and I want to welcome everyone to our first plenary session. So what we have confirmed through this conference is that the work cannot be done in silos. And I'm sure you all agree. What we are fighting against in San Diego, where I am, is what the communities are fighting against in Los Angeles, in San Jose, in New York, in New Jersey, in Milwaukee, and even Alberta, Canada. That's what I learned in this conference. And for this reason, we must come together to combat the targeting of our communities, from the criminalization of poor people to the strategic targeting of communities of color through gang injunctions and gentrification and the practice of under-resourcing and underserving communities of color. And we know that this is all a part of a plan to displace and extract. This is a plan that is part of coordinated efforts on the part of many local, state, and federal government systems and agencies. So another thing that we've confirmed through this conference is that we must continue the work together and we have to fight together. And because we know what's best for us as impacted people, we must be at the table making decisions about our communities. So with that, I am giving the floor to Mr. Alex Vitali, who will lead our first plenary session, Building a National Network. Let me just tell you a little bit about Alex before he gets on the floor. In an interview that I saw of Mr. Vitali, he was asked if he could give the audience his point of view about what police should be. And he answered that it is not about what the police should be, but what we should be doing instead of policing. Alex Vitali is an author and professor of sociology at Brooklyn College. He's also the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, The Appeal, USA Today, Vice News, and other media outlets. And now he is here with us on this morning, and we're very grateful for that. So without further ado, I'm going to give the microphone, the stage, the floor, all of those things to Mr. Alex Vitali. Thank you so much. Thank you, Genevieve. Appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure such elaborate introductions are required in this grouping, but I'm very happy to be here with everyone uh, this morning on the West Coast, uh, this afternoon here on the East Coast. Um, so I have not, or and I don't think anyone else has come in with a specific agenda for this conversation, but I will give a little bit of historical background about where I think we're at and then uh, offer people a chance to, to add to that. We'll do some introductions, et cetera. So this is not the first gathering of this kind to happen in recent years. Uh, we hosted a very similar kind of gathering uh, about five years ago and a smaller gathering uh, about three years ago here in New York. Uh, so that's how uh, some of us uh, on this call met each other the first time was uh, at these gatherings in New York. And the goal of those gatherings was to begin to build the feeling that there was a national movement and that there was better coordination. So in New York, we've always looked carefully at work that was being done in Chicago and California around gang databases, around resistance to conspiracy cases, and also just the overall attempt to reframe the conversation away from better policing to alternatives to policing and how to you know, dismantle an ever expanding criminal legal approach to the problem that young problems that young people and communities face. Uh, and of course, we're experiencing a resurgence 
of this criminalization mindset, a backlash against the victories that uh, were won both practically and rhetorically last summer. So in practice, there has been a fair amount of informal information sharing between folks in different cities. And I think there's been a fair amount of people reading each other's reports and, and checking in from time to time. Um, but there has not been any kind of coordinated national strategy or even a formal way for people to regularly check in, uh, compare notes, talk strategy, uh, share best practices, et cetera. And so uh, part of the hope in bringing this together was to see whether or not there is interest, capacity, whether there is sufficient utility in such a gathering, et cetera. A uh, couple more things. One is I'll just say that, you know, there are various forms of national networks working on the issues of over policing. So obviously the movement for black lives has been doing a lot of that work in a lot of cities. Now they're focused on a broad range of policing issues. Also uh, black lives matter, which is overlapping, but slightly similar, you know, has a grassroots base in a number of different cities. Uh, uh, Judy uh, and Joya just gave a presentation about the national network that we've put together to push back against federal task forces. Uh, in some cases, these networks have been involved in raising funds, providing technical assistance, coordinating strategy, uh, media, et cetera. Uh, so now the question is, you know, is there a need or desire or ability to do something uh, along those lines here? Uh, okay, so I think it would be useful. I think we're a small enough group that we could do this, that we could, we could ask people to uh, go around and introduce themselves. I think it might be helpful if I'll just call on people as I see them on my list and people let me know if I miss someone. And what I'm interested in in these introductions, if possible, is if people could say something about their aff affiliations, obviously where they are and any thoughts they have just initially about uh, the desirability and capacity to, to put some some kind of form formation together here, and then maybe we can talk about uh, you know specifics. So um, I'm just going to go right at the top here. I think I'm in alpha order. What I see here is Allison Santana. There are no tildes in Zoom, so excuse me if I didn't get that quite right. Allison able to join there we go yeah hi sorry I didn't um quite hear your question so the question the question is if you could tell us a little bit like where you are if you have an organizational affiliation and then if you have any already existing ideas about the utility and and form of some kind of national network um I don't have an affiliation I heard about this through Professor Alexander um, and I decided to join because I want to become more educated, particularly about um, gang um, affiliated members and how um, more accessibility to education can be created. Um, as someone that just left or graduated from UCSD, I noticed that as a student, it became less um accessible for members of my community so that was something that really like drew me to join and learn about this um from what i can see and an idea that i have for perhaps creating a more um accessible movement and national movement i feel like young people have to become more active in their um, reach out, not just to other members of the institution, but to our families and our neighbors. I noticed that as a student, I 
would share my ideals, but it was mostly with other students that were aware about these issues. I didn't necessarily share with my neighbors or my family because of that, um, having to commute um, and do all that. But during the pandemic, as I had more time to be at home and had more time to be in my community, it became more clear to me that we have to reach within our communities in order to create a network. Um, because education, like I personally feel like I had access to education, but then there was a part of me that also forgot to share that education and make it more accessible to those that didn't have time to indulge in theory. Yeah, like I uh, so, Allison, if I could just stop you, I, this is not quite the time for a whole analysis, just really wanted this very brief idea of like, institutional affiliation and specific plans for a national network. So Allison raises a presentation though does raise an issue, which is whether or not such a network would be limited to organizations or whether it would be possible for individuals who are not affiliated to be involved. Uh, so my first thought to you, Allison, is you need to join an organization that's actually doing work, right? That's the way to most effectively contribute. Uh, but let me let me just uh, and then Allison, there'll be a chance to come back and talk about some of those issues later, I think. So uh, just going alphabetically, Andrea St. Julian, one of our lovely co-hosts. Yes. And thank you, Allison. I really, really appreciated hearing your thoughts. Um, well, I, I'm going to feel like I'm a ringer because uh, uh, I, you know, I conceived this conference about five or six years ago, and I'm a convener of the conference. I'm affiliated with far too many organizations to name here, but I will name one, San Diegans for Justice. Um, I, of course, believe that we need a national network. Um, that is why I, um, that was, again, how, how and why I conceived this conference and why I've worked uh, for the last 10 months to make sure it, it came to pass. I think though that uh, it should be open to both organizations and individuals. Um, uh, and um, I, I think it's so important to do that because if there is one reason, one thing that keeps us from moving forward, it is that we are not as organized as we should be. Organized power is realized power. So those are my thoughts. Great, thank you, Andrea. Ashley? All right, while we're waiting for Ashley, I'll uh, maybe ask Babe to check in. Hi, I'm Babe Howell. I am affiliated with the Gangs Coalition here in New York, the uh, grassroots advocates for neighborhood groups. And I think in the name is our idea that we do have to get away from the idea that really pathologizes gangs. Like gangs are naturally occurring groups that could be a lo location for really, you know, political involvement, for social involvement, for building and developing neighborhoods and making them stronger. Uh, and I think it's very deliberate. Uh, effort to, to, to tear down those naturally occurring associations. Um, so, you know, one really important part of this national coalition is to change that conversation. Of course, we don't want violent crime, but that is not the same thing as gangs. And, uh, does it, and, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Alex. Did, uh, did, did we get Ashley back? Maybe Ashley is a passive uh, listener to the conversation. Uh, Cheryl? All right, well, we're waiting. Let's see if Cheryl wants to contribute. Let's, oh, here she comes. Um, hi, my name is Cheryl Sweeney Jones. I'm here in San Diego. I am probably uh, the only district attorney um, on the call, um, but I am a, a, a community partnership prosecutor. So in that role, I spend time not in the courtroom, but in the community, um, working to um, stop crime before it happens, working to uh, disrupt the school to prison pipeline, 
there's a lot of uh, conversation here in San Diego about gangs and gang enhancements and why they are so uh, damaging to the community. So I really just joined the conversation today to get a better idea of, um, of, the, of the views that go behind why gangs are, gang of, uh, en enhancements are so detrimental. So, but I am having been on the prosecution side for 22 years, prosecuting everything from misdemeanors to murders, I'm really, I'm now on the side trying to understand where, why crime happens and what role the DA can play. I know we're kind of thought of as the bad guys in this whole process, but what role, that, what active role we can play to, uh, to actually join forces with you guys, so. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Colleen? I don't want to skip Chris because he's alphabetically before me. Um, well, go ahead and I will figure okay. out. I don't even see a Chris on my list. Yeah, Chris, Chris Mitchell, I see. Um, oh, he's at the my bottom. Name's Colleen my name Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Colleen. So, my name is Colleen Cusack and I'm from San Diego. Um, I've been a criminal defense attorney for 29 years. Um, I am affiliated with a lot of in organizations, but I very much consider myself an individual force. So I, I do what I need to do, but then I can tap into those organizational affiliations to support me in what I'm doing. So I encourage Ashley um, to, to be a individual. Um, and not feel like she has to hide in an organization, but use organizations um, as as our uh, weapons, as our armor kind of thing, because every organization is made up of individuals. Um, I see the, the movement moving forward because I'm a group of another um, organization here in San Diego that is an affiliation of organizations. And um, our strength would be in being able to come together a few times a year, like maybe four seasonally, four times um, in a Zoom and to um, make good use of that time because we are all very busy individuals, um, but to be able to support what each of us is doing, um, spread awareness of what each of us is doing so that we can take that to our individual communities and apply the, the good stuff. Um, and be able to uh, mobile, mobilize on social media at a heartbeat to be able to say, okay, everybody go attack this right now and, and be, have the numbers behind us that we can make a showing on Twitter, on Instagram, um, Facebook's evil. So I'm giving up on Facebook. Um, and, and so that's, that's my vision for coming together. And I very, very much want, um, I, I depend on the organizational affiliations I'm with to help refuel me, to help remind me of why I'm doing what I'm doing and keep me um, focused. So I very much would like a national one to do the same. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dan? Hi, uh, Dan Jones from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I think like Cheryl, I am I'm maybe the only police officer on this call. Um, I, I'm a police officer. I've been a police officer for 24 years. Uh, I'm also a researcher where we my research is uh, looking at the victim offender overlap and understanding the justice client better. Understanding the vast majority of criminality is symptomatic of trauma or survival crime. And in order for our communities to feel safe with the police, if the police are still around, it has to be around compassionate policing and uh, understanding of who people are uh, and moving towards the, the goal of reduction in crime severity and the reduction of incarceration. Uh, far too often, police officers and police systems measure measure success based on arrest rates and sentencing, and, and that's the wrong way to do things. So, I've spent uh, a long time uh, in this in this space. I was a correctional officer for three years as well, and I have had to unlearn a lot of things. It was interesting today. Someone talked about broken windows theory and how that was something that that our organization did for a while, and realizing that all we did was overcriminalize certain populations. So, I think it needs to be more than just a national. Uh, coalition. I think it needs to be at least a North American coalition. Um, people oftentimes look at Canada as the nice country, but I can tell you that we've had a 56% increase in incarceration of Indigenous people over the last 10 years. 
And you are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated if you're Indigenous than in this country if you're non-Indigenous. So I think we need to have the conversation broader than the United States. And that's just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Desiree? While we're waiting for Desiree, we could try Devin. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Devin Jones. I currently live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, I'm a senior at Aquinas College and an intern at Mercantile Bank. Um, I'm interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And my specific reason for being here on this call today is to kind of learn more about the different ways I can uh, positively impact my communities over here. So. Uh, I don't remember who specifically, but uh, somebody mentioned earlier just taking the good stuff from conferences like these and uh, going back to my neighborhoods and, you know, trying to contribute positively. I don't really have any ideas in regards to establishing a national network that is uh, as powerful as uh, we are trying to establish, but I, I am interested in, in being a part of it uh, once it is established. So that's kind of why I'm sitting in here and just learning as much as I can today. Thank you, Devin. Uh... Did, did Desiree, is Desiree interested in checking in? If not, uh, I think we've just been joined by Diane Kim. If you want to introduce yourself and maybe say anything about thoughts you've had about a, a establishing a national network. Hi everyone, my name is Diane Kim. Um, I am a resident of San Diego. I also work for Community Advocates for Just and Moral Governance and um, I just joined. I heard someone who was just sharing about like really listening and learning and that's definitely where I think that I'm at. I wanna take the lead of the folks that have already been doing this work and I wanna know how I can amplify and participate in that. So I'm gonna leave it to the experts on this one. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Felicity? Sorry, thank you, Alex, uh, fellow Hampshire grad. Um, so <laughs> hello to everyone in Springfield, Massachusetts also. Um, so I'm here in Irvine, California, which is in Orange County and um, have been working with a number of different organizations. One is the Orange County Rapid Response Network. We respond um, with uh, trying to empower community members that have been affected by ICE either themselves personally or their family members who um, could be in immigration detention. Um, and with that organization and also um, a, a recent organization called the People's Budget Orange County, which is kind of uh, mirrors what the um, People's Budget in LA has been doing. Um, we're trying to uh, work on uh, delegitimizing the Orange County Sheriff, who is terrible. Um, and one of the things that we're working on on a statewide level is the passage of AB 937, which is the um, Vision Act, which would outlaw all uh, <clears throat> ICE transfers between um, local police and the California Department of, um, of uh, Incarceration um, and any Im federal immigration forces. Um, also working kind of tangentially with the NAACP here in Orange County, um, but they aren't really, they're working more on integration of faculties in local schools. There is a small uh, part that is working on issues of um, people of color who've been unjustly arrested and held on bail, primarily in some of the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, rallies that we have had here in Orange County. So. That's about it. Thank you, Francisco. Yes, thank you. Um, Francisco Romero here with Unión del Barrio, uh, Chiques Community Coalition out of Oxnard and Los Angeles. Really, uh, we came on here um, to learn from, from each other around ways that we could um, tackle um, broad uh, criminalization strategies such as the civil gang injunctions. We worked on uh, that process of dismantling the, the the breadth and the scope of these for the last 20 years. And we see a turning, it so, sounds like there's a turn uh, we've made uh, collectively 
um, through a lot of the uh, reform measures that are happening with uh, a lot of the budgeting, uh, you know, thing Felicity just mentioned, you know, here in Los Angeles, there, there was there's a big there was a big coalition uh, of forces that that really talked about this thing called Measure J, kind of diverting and um, disinvesting slash reinvesting into approaches that are about you know the social uh, you know pow the power of the social being of community uh, versus the the, the traditional um, criminalization militarization strategies. Uh, we believe that until that happens, until there is a equilibrium around the question of uh, resource distribution um, that that it'll be very tough to deal with the question, the questions that we're talking about today. So so we're all about that. Um, we're here. We're learning. Uh, we also believe in collectivism and dialogue and debate. And so we're open to to that to that as well. And so just excited to be here. I want to th thank thank you thank you to Sean and uh, Garcia Leyes and all those folks that invited us to to be part of the conversation. Welcome, Francisco. Uh, Gabby. Yes, hello. Um, I presented just earlier on uh, gang injunctions, and I am part of an organization here uh, in Orange County, California, uh, Chicanos Unidos, and we primarily focus uh, efforts in Santa Ana, but, but uh, get involved with anything that's uh, um, criminalizing the community. Um, most of my efforts have been working on dismantling gang injunctions for the last 10 years. Um, here and in Santa Barbara. Um, and then we also focus on issues on gentrification and how they're all uh, connected. Um, and then also push for uh, changes in the political climate here. Great, thank you. Any, any thoughts about national networking? We would definitely be interested. Okay, that's useful to know. Uh, Janine Grigsby? Hi, my name is Janine Grixby. I work actually for Alameda County Probation Department. I'm an attorney, but my job there is in the reentry and outreach unit. So I work with providing services to people who are on probation based on the AB 109 funding and really um, coordinating all the services that are available from CBOs within the community. So um, I definitely think national network is important. You can't do any kind of systems dismantling without <laughs> the whole nation being involved or engaged in that process. So I think it's important and individuals, I think, um, should at least be able to have a, have a place at the table, even if they're not normally engaged. It, it, when, if you have any kind of convening, I think it's really important to have those voices there to be heard too. Thank you. Uh, Judy? Hey, I'm Judy Green. Uh, I am active in the New York City Gangs Coalition with Alex and Babe and a bunch of other folks that have been uh, involved in the conference all three days. Uh, I come to that work after many, many years of concern about policing um, and uh, the criminal legal system and all of its problems um, in general uh, with an awareness that the, uh, the gang enforcement uh, has really been a federal project, a federal tool uh, to criminalize, uh, profile, arrest, and incarcerate young black and brown people um, since way before Bill Barr established violent gang safe street task forces, so-called federal uh, task forces in every FBI office uh, going back to 1992, the first time that he was the attorney general. So um, I just finished a, um, a workshop looking at um, what Bill Barr did during the Trump administration involving setting up task forces yet again, the infamous Operation Relentless Pursuit, work with Alex uh, in a network of uh, folks in local cities that he targeted for that effort. And a lot of that effort was uh, advertised as uh, being, uh, you know, gang interventions, uh, your basic um, counterinsurgency operations directed by the federal government with lots of money to hire more cops coming from the Department of Justice uh, cops office 
so I am here to network. I'm very interested in networking uh, and I'm waiting to see uh, what can grow from this. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Is that me from Care Coalition? Yes, please. Uh, Kelly White from Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition, Washington, DC. We uh, primarily work with people who are impacted by detention in Virginia and Maryland area. Uh, so ICE detention. Um, I'm, I'm here because um, so many people I work with are impacted by uh, gang databases. And so wanting to learn more and wanting to, you know, wanting a need for a national strategy on this and really wanting to learn to learn from abolitionists as well as um, folks looking at a staggered or incremental approach. Um, just thank you for this forum. You bet. Uh, Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Romo. I'm with the California State Public Defender. I'm in uh, Oakland, California. And um, for the last 30 years, I've done uh, death penalty defense. And um, through that work, I've been um, working hard at um, challenging uh, gang laws that are step law as, um, as it's applied in the death penalty context. But our mandate is changing to help improve indigent defense in California generally. So in addition to my gang work, I'm, I'm now doing a, a lot of with the Racial Justice Act. And, um, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, to say a silo is, is an understatement. I've been so siloed for so long. I am so excited to be out of the silo. And um, I think, the, as I've said before, and as I'm learning at this conference, the most important thing in um, our work is to change the narrative. And I think it will take a national coalition to do that. I mean, California Californians like to think of themselves as kind of a, a breed apart. And, and so I've never really thought, you know, that I, about how important national contacts are. But in the last year or so, I've been making them, and I realized that that yeah, we we need to work together. So I think it's a great idea. Great, uh, Mono. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Mano Raju. I'm the San Francisco Public Defender. Uh, good to see everyone. I you know haven't been able to attend as much of the conference as I wanted to, although I did pop in yesterday for a bit, came into a chat room this morning, had a great uh, conversation with uh, one of the organizers and uh, caught the last one. So I'm not sure what the call of the question is, but I think it's something about what are we looking forward to? Is that well, in terms of thoughts that you have about a national network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, hugely important um, seeing um, you know, that we have academics, uh, practicing defenders, uh, community organizers and community based organizations on this call. I think that's the direction we need to move in. Um, one thing that uh, uh, has been helpful to me in my own practice personally is actually calling in community experts into the courtroom to contradict the gang task force experts. And I found jurors have been extremely receptive uh, to those experts and also um really breaking down the jury instructions as opposed to being intimidated by them because when you actually look at the instru instructions it's actually a lot harder to convict someone of at least in california if you really get in there but i find too many of us are sort of intimidated by the the overwhelming evidence and frankly end up pleading our clients earlier than we should and i think we can actually have success if we organize along with the community and do some deeper training in this area but i also think this is a national issue and we need to start having those conversations, start doing the community education, start doing the collective brainstorming um, with this wide network. And I'm eager to um, start that process because I think sometimes we'll get you know, caught up in one, like maybe legislative reform, and we really have to have much larger conversations. And I think we have to really think about what's our North Star, what's our two-year plan, what's our five-year plan, what's our, even if we can't, let's at least envision what that would be so that if we're working on something, we put it in the proper context. Um, but I'm very excited about these possibilities. I want to thank um, uh, Andrea, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and and all the other organizers for, for pulling this together. And I'm really looking forward to uh, being aware of it 
earlier and, and making more contribution next time. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mano. Uh, next, Matt. Uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, Matt Soto Rosen. I'm I'm a public defender in San Francisco. I work with Mano. Um, I've been a public defender for almost 23 years now, and um, most of it in San Francisco. And to kind of to echo uh, Lisa's comments, San Francisco thinks of itself as a very progressive place, but we know that that's not really the case when it comes to our clients and and people of color in San Francisco which are increasingly a, 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 a minority. Um, and um, so it's really, really helpful. I've learned so much listening to everyone these past two days to get new, fresh ideas. And that's what we need. And that's why I'm really looking forward to working with everyone. And, and we're constantly um, using, as, as Mino said, community experts. Um, I saw some, some people give a great uh, presentation. I think it was Friday that, that I'm gonna now contact to see if they're willing to be experts uh, on, on Latinx issues, um, Lucero and, and Alex. Um, and also just, you know, even though San Francisco and California thinks of itself as such a trailblazing state, um, they're also trailblazing in, in bad ways with the, the, the introduction of all these gang statutes, the STEP Act, the three strikes law, they, they trailblaze, the California legislature trailblazed those too. So let's not let's not forget that. And we're constantly having to bring in, you know, hey, look, look what the New Jersey Supreme Court did in this context, Your Honor, just to kind of get people to start thinking about new and fresh ideas. So I, I really welcome this this national and dialogue. And, and thank you guys so much for for putting this together. Great. One one theme I'm hearing is there's both the need for people in certain practice areas to have communication in different venues, but also how people in the different practice areas need to be talking to each other. So the folks doing work on the streets, folks doing work in the courtroom, folks doing work in the classroom need to be better coordinated as well. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Professor Shabazz. Yes, thank you. I've uh, put my contact in the chat. I'm president of the National Council for Black Studies and uh, professor out here in Western Mass uh, at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, I also put in the chat a link to a story last month from the uh, Springfield Republican uh, about uh, that shows a kind of deepening investment with the district attorney's office and law enforcement here in um, here in uh, uh, Western Mass, in terms of uh, looking at areas like Knox Street in in uh, Springfield as uh, being uh, under the control of a posse and uh, and and therefore uh, subject to uh, these kinds of intense uh, tactics. What's going on in the law uh, and how things are in, in the state, or maybe moving in the state? I'm not. I'm not sure of, but I'm uh, very much uh, interested in uh, seeing uh, the development of a network. Um, I was in a session yesterday from a, uh, a woman who I identified as gang affiliated and um, from San Diego. She went to City College, did a master's thesis on uh, gang affiliated students who had gone to college and were uh, what their experiences were in higher ed. And what most struck me in her uh, presentation was what it seemed like a lack of, um, of an academic network to provide any kind of mentoring or support for her as she attempted to do a uh, really important cutting edge kind of research. She got a lot of pushback from the Institutional Review Board in the name of trying to protect her uh, the, the sources she was interviewing. She got a lot of pushback from other professors calling for her to, to soften her, her, her language and her approach. So uh, it really strikes me that whatever network is created, aside from those working in legal areas, policy areas, if there might also be a network uh, included in that uh, for, for academics, for scholars to talk about how do we better support uh, individuals like Gabrielle and, and others who, uh, who attempt to navigate uh, institutions of higher ed to uh, to further to invest in themselves and be able to help their community better. 
Great, thank you. Rachel? Hi, um, my name is Rachel Johnson. I'm attending this conference as an intern um, with the Advocates for Death and Moral Governance in San Diego and finishing my bachelor's in criminal justice at San Diego State University. However, I live in Oregon. My work going forward um, is going to try to bring these types of resources to smaller communities in Oregon. The big city, Portland, Eugene, there is a lot of activism. There is a lot of groups. Just in the last few months, I've been trying to find organizations to work with locally, and there are none. A national network would be so beneficial because these smaller communities are not devoid of these issues whatsoever. But a lot of the work is doing done, being done in bigger cities. And I'm not, I don't want to move to Portland to work there. I want to work in my community and address these issues here. And it would take a lot of support. Um, so I, I think it would be fantastic, especially in accessibility. If I don't have an organization to join, I would have to work as an individual or create my own. And that's, you know, I would need a lot of support to do that. Thanks. Great. Yeah, I think one of the challenges has been that we have a sense of what's going on in, in LA, San Diego, Oakland, Chicago, New York, but often th this gang stuff is happening all over the place and we're, th we're not networked outside those major cities, right? So like hearing about these efforts in Springfield, Mass uh, is I think really important. Uh, Sean? Hi, uh, my name is Sean. I'm the executive director of the Peace and Justice Law Center in Southern California. Um, my work focuses on community safety, recognizing that um, state violence is often as much a threat as community violence. Um, I believe that a national network is essential in the kind of work we're doing here at this conference of learning from each other. Um, <clears throat> I think I've also found myself working nationally around federal law, uh, particularly around immigration law and seeing deportation as a form of gang suppression. Um, I also hear what people are saying that there are many places that are not, um, sort of the fight hasn't gotten there yet. At least our side hasn't shown up yet. Um, and I wanna be there. Uh, and I, I just also have this nagging sense that there is something great that is that I'm failing to imagine that would come of it. Uh, and and uh, either somebody else has imagined it or we'll find it by pursuing it. Um, but, you know, I, I know it's there. I just feel it. You, you know, you reminded me in, within the defund movement, there are these learning communities that have been facilitated by Andrea Ritchie and some others through the, um, uh, what a community, what the, the justice hub. And so they have this network of people that they invite and they do these targeted learning communities about police unions or about use of force or about, you know, narcotics units or whatever. And so uh, that, that, that sparked in some, some potential ideas. Uh, Chris? I know Chris introduced himself in the chat as well. He's a, a self-advocate for the ARC of the USA. I'm not familiar with that group or where it's located, though. I don't know, Chris, if you want to give us some more details about that. Uh, he doesn't. Yeah? Yeah, he doesn't have, Chris doesn't have a microphone. I see that on the thing there. So anyway, if Chris wants to just type in a little bit more in, in the uh, chat so that we have a sense. Okay, so um, there's clearly, you know, support for the idea here, but that's, uh, we, there are many more steps though to make that a reality. So there are big issues about capacity to coordinate such activity. I think, you know, there's interest in having it be open to organizations and individuals. There's the question of whether or not 
it is making decisions in some formal way, or it's just acting as a network, learning community, sharing of information, resources, ideas, uh, uh, creating spaces for strategic conversations, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a question about whether or not it would be open to anyone with any connection to law enforcement. We have three people on the call who work for law enforcement. And I know in New York, that's a non-starter for us. We would not be able to be a part of a coalition that had anyone connected to law enforcement, attorneys, probation, police, any of uh, uh, district attorney. Yeah, any of that. So that's something we have we have to think about because in part what we're doing is developing strategies to directly challenge the practices and strategies of those institutions. So we can't have a fruitful strategic conversation, even if the individuals may be sympathetic, uh, we, can't, we, can't have, uh, we can't be a part of such conversations with the work that we do. So um, I'm open to having people pick up some piece of this that we need to talk through. Should we talk about whether or not we are trying to create something that is a formal coalition or something that's more network? Maybe we could just take that on for a second. Alan? Yeah, I think, um, you know, oftentimes with, with these kind of things, you kind of have to start in a particular place and let it develop. You know, it might, you know, to try to organize a rigid coalition right off the bat might be a little too difficult, but starting out with a network um, and seeing, you know, what that's going to be and, and how that's going to form might be the easiest way to start. Um, uh, the conference is going to send out a survey uh, sometime today or tomorrow, and we, you um, We'll put it out there if people would like to see decriminalizing neighborhoods turn into a national network and what that might uh, uh, look like. Um, so, you know, we could, we could start there. I'd like to endorse uh, that approach as well that um, Andrea is giving in that uh, as a president of a, of a somewhat small organization, um, it, 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 it does bring up a resource question. Who's, who's available to put in the time to keep the, to keep the network information flowing, to organize things? Andrea just was talking about putting in 10 months to make this, this conference happen. Um, and so once it raises a resource question, it then raises, you know, how do you, how do you develop the resources? Are you going to write a grant? Are you going to, uh, you know, is there a donor or, or, or how, or do you just tax the member organizations or member individuals to, to support, uh, to support the work of the group? So I think, yes, start kind of organically scale up as, as you get more, uh, people involved, more investment. Uh, more support involved and, and then see where it goes from there. Thank you. Does, does anyone want to make the counter argument for uh, creating something that is more fixed, has a set membership, is making actual decisions? Okay, so I don't... Oh, actually, let me jump in uh, yeah. with, I have another counter proposal, uh -huh. um, although something more formal in my mind requires uh, money um, to be really, I mean, that's the formality is often are expensive. Uh, so I'm not opposed to it if there was a source of money. But my other counter proposal is I wonder if there are not organizations, national organizations that already exist that share our goals, but we are just not connected to and that perhaps uh, we could join and they could make space and, you know, make common cause without starting from scratch with something new. Uh, but I don't have any organization to suggest off the top of my head. You know, there are some national like anti-violence groups. Some are more focused on like gun control. Some work closely with police in various capacities. Some I think might be more sympathetic to this. Uh, but the fact that 
so far, at least no one on the call is actually working with any of those people. So, Andrea, do you have some ideas here? No. I would, yeah. No, I, I um, don't know of any either. Um, and I'll, always just to put a little something out there, uh, a little bit of my concern is, is that we might be swallowed up by a group that is not designed for our central purpose, you know, and that, that it would be really hard to focus in on and create a pathway for exactly what we all want to do um, by going through another organization. But I'd be all open to it if there were such an organization that, that could truly support us. Does anyone know the Community Justice Action Fund? Yes, Felicity? I mean, I know them because during the pandemic, I followed all of their webinars and things that they were doing. Um, and they have, I don't believe, I think they only have some connections um, here in, in like in Los Angeles. I, I know not in Orange County. Um, but their work seems to be primarily <clears throat> about gun violence and um, with what they're talking about earlier, one of the workshops, credible messengers within different communities in Baltimore, um, in Philadelphia. Um, they do, a, it's amazing work that they do. But I think it's just primarily focused on gun violence, not so much on policing per se. Well, I'm looking at their website and it says, one of their main points is police violence is gun violence. Oh, well, I, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So I have a relationship with Amber Goodwin, who, who's based in Houston, who's on their board. And anyway, that, so that's, that's a group that seems like there might be some potential, but it's only just a potential uh, space. My sense though, from hearing from folks for now, what we should be trying to do is to create some kind of network to harness some resources that we already have. And then the next thing to talk about would be to, if we have ideas about how to maybe get some additional resources so that there could be someone whose responsibilities include you know, maintaining the network, coordinating the network. So not making decisions, you know, or being the executive director of the network, but someone who's keeping the mailing lists updated and facilitating, you know, learning communities and things like that. Does that sound like a, a direction to start with? Any, any concerns or counter proposals to that? still it's a little vague so then the question is so what would some of the tasks be uh for such a set of responsibilities so i mentioned for instance maybe people could just put stuff in the chat of what they think the 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 actual activities concretely of such a coordinator would be. So I mentioned, for instance, uh, maintaining a contact database. I'd also ask, is there a commitment to keeping the this conference going on, a, on an annual or, or some basis? That would certainly be. That's a great question. Yeah. What else? I think we, you know, just kind of the basics, we'd have to have a website and we could attach to that some kind of a, uh, a you know, a, a member database where people can contact each other. We should, I would think that that website would have uh, resources listed on it uh, under particular topics. We could also start coalescing around particular issues that and strategies that we think are most important. And I think, again, the website could be the central hub for that. Um, we would then start thinking about, do we wanna have meetings? Um, do we want to meet once a year, twice a year, quarterly? And again, do we wanna continue 
holding this conference annually or biannually? And I think that if we answered those questions, we'd have a, oh, and Sean is absolutely right. You have to raise money, right? And figure out how we're gonna raise money. I think if we answered all of those questions, we would, um, or we could do most of those things, we would have a really good network set up. Oh, and then, then marketing, or, or not, and when I say marketing, I mean um, letting, making sure that organizations and individuals know and understand that this, organ, this, this network exists. I put in the chat the defundpolice.org website, which I have some, you know, I think there's some limits to it, but if you scroll down a little bit, there's a map and next to the map is a group of issue areas. So you could either do a geographic search. Oh, who's in the network in my geographic area? I click on that and then up comes a list of organizations and individuals or who's working on gang databases. And then you get a list of everyone who's working on gang databases. Um, There's also a question in the chat from Lisa uh, for you, Alex. She was just hoping you could share yes. a little bit more about yeah, the Yeah, I was the, just taking a Coalition. quick note here. So okay. th thank you. So we maintain a website. Uh, we have, we're, we're more of a coalition than a network. So we actually make decisions, carry out campaigns, organize demonstrations, develop legislation, so it's, a, it's not exactly analogous to having a, a, a network of information sharing. But we may want to turn into a coalition. That, absolutely, that's, uh, that's always a possibility, yeah. So maybe, you know, having practice area groups and learning communities, something like that could be something that would be part of it. And certainly gathering information on, on the desire to build a coalition and what issues we wanna maybe coalesce around to start working toward creating a coalition. So uh, what's, uh, how much time do we have left on this call? I think we're running close here, is that right? We have about 17 minutes left. Okay, thank we're you. We're going until 1245. Yep. Okay. So then the question is, should we should we get down to brass tacks in terms of uh, responsibilities and stuff? Or do the conference organizers want to take this and have a conversation separately to work out more details? Or do you want me to keep trying to, to push something? Uh, well, I, I certainly think that um, uh, the conveners of the conference should def would we will definitely want to speak about how we might be able to facilitate this. You know, it's always bandwidth is the issue. Um, I would definitely ask people and uh, on this on this um, call to put in the chat in the chat if they are interested in uh, uh, being part of a, a working committee to uh, create this network and potentially this coalition. So please put that information in the chat now. Um, and I will make sure that I will also put a question in the survey that we're going to, to um, send out for people to uh, give me information if they, if they or their organization wants to be part of the networking with the coalition and um, if they are willing to participate in that. So, um, and, and, and when I say participate, willing to be part of the committee that is really going to get this going and get this started. So um, how does that sound, Alex? So we, we basically, we're gonna assume that everyone who's participated in the conference is, is potentially interested in the existence of a network and being part of it unless they say otherwise. But what we're looking for right now is people who would help actually bring it to fruition. Exactly, exactly. 
Well, certainly you can, you, you can, you can count me in and we can talk about, you know, what the gangs coalition more broadly, but uh, the policing and social justice project specifically, you know, is, is interested in, in helping with that. Fantastic. I'd also like to hear more thoughts from other people though, about this early formation. I, I, uh, cause I kind of did a lot of the talking when I really want to hear what other people want to see in terms of how we form and what that initial formation looks like. Colleen. Hi. Um, I, I think we, we kind of somewhat form just in this one little group um, in terms of expressing our intention and our desire. I, I don't know that we would have much power as a coalition until we're more organized. So we need that organization, we need that cohesiveness uh, as a national group in order to um, coalesce. Um, but that's where I would like to see it going to give us a national voice on, on these national issues uh, eventually. And we just uh, need to build um, and do so. And so I think there is a lot of uh, conscious deliberative effort that needs to go into setting it up um, to, to give us the framework so that we can get to where we need to go eventually. And if I can uh, just, because uh, I, I would also like to throw this out to the group um, because Dan just mentioned, yeah, he's interested, but he's law enforcement. So um, I just want to throw this out that, you know, perhaps, you know, the network and the coalition would not be able to maintain within the organization itself, law enforcement, but that if we have some kind of um, auxiliary committee where law enforcement who that you know, really uh, uh, believe in our mission can have kind of a separate organization that, that, that is um, connected uh, or, or at least open with us um, that um, they can dialogue with us. Be, and and, and uh, Colleen is looking like now. <laughs> I, I, I'm just having, so there is an organization that I'm not going to name that I'm a part of. And the national just sent a thing out saying, if you have any affiliation with the police agency, if you ever work for a police agency, you can't do what you're doing for us anymore, mm -hmm. unless we approve you. And so in the eighties for three months, I dispatched for the police. And that experience informed my decision. I learned that there were police officers who thought that, who bragged about their flashlight, knowing their flashlight was 12 stitches wide. Um, they, they did things that, that were just total, complete lawlessness, um, but they knew they, they wouldn't be, be uh, checked. And so those all informed my decision to become a defense attorney, but yet somebody's looking at it from an abstract saying, if you had any experience with them, boom, you're out. Um, I think I would like to move us to, to switch to what Dan Jones was talking about in another presentation to compassionate policing. And there are police out there that I think are comport with our, what we, what we envision for the future. Um, as defense attorneys, we accept that, that there are, that people are rehabilit people rehabilitation and redeem redemption and there are lost souls, so to speak. And so um, I, I, I I'd like to take the judgment out of our groups that we're not we're not judging and affiliating people just because of their like, you know, I, I present every presentation as if if there's a team of police officers and prosecutors watching me, great, maybe they'll learn something. Um, because I'm not saying anything that's super secret that um, that they that, that is gonna <coughs> But you know, Colleen, make, make, you're not. But Colleen, you're not going to discuss your defense strategy in front of the opposing counsel. No. Okay. Well, there's a lot of analogy here, right? So, yes, anybody who ever knew a police officer is canceled is not what we're talking about here. But we have people on the call who are working prosecutors and working police officers, and so that means we can't have a discussion about strategies to go against prosecutorial practices because they're listening to the call. 
hearing our strategic conversation about how to oppose their practices. So obviously a website can be open to the public. We can have conferences that can be open to the public, but we cannot have movement strategy conversations with district attorneys and police in the room. I have some thoughts about that. Oh, oh baby, she rose. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, like, I think you got to assume they're in the room, not the ones that would want to be there and are working with you, but they'll always infiltrate. Um, so, um, at the same time, because so many people are so often criminalized, having active police and active uh, prosecutors may not work. Like you wanna at least say, in theory, that's not what's going on here. I do think a collaboration and a wing might make sense. There's gonna be no advocate who's more persuasive than the cop who says, this is bad policing, this is racist policing, than the prosecutor who says, I can't sleep at night because I, I, I collaborated in these takedowns and people went to prison because of their associations and First Amendment rights. So, you know, I, I think there's a world in which, A, we have to assume that the ones that don't mean us well are in the room. <laughs> and B, uh, we do have to think about a, a constructive collaboration because I think they could be really useful al allies yeah, and they, they can reform. May I make a comment? Please, Dan. Um, so for me, and I, under, I totally understand the reticence of having active police officers. I do understand it. Um, but I also understand, you know, working with people who use drugs and the whole concept of nothing to us without us. And I, I see that similarly in policing because, and believe me, I have beat my head against a wall for a lot of years now. And I run into all kinds of different roadblocks and sometimes at the peril of my own career, being as vocal as I've been about how we do things. And I often say, it's not what the police do, it's how we do it. And how we do it is often uh, marginalizing people, continuously over-criminalizing neighborhoods, um, impacting people uh, of color and indigenous people in, in a way that, that is offensive. Uh, and I get that. Uh, at the same time, um, it becomes really easy to dismiss anything that is said by a coalition that has no policing connection. And that dismissiveness creates a divisiveness, which creates a us versus them mentality. And I truly believe that um, in order for us to make actual change, we need to be, um, we need to be close. We need to have that um, connection with each other um, because that builds relationships and that builds change. If we are distant from each other, we continuously build that divisiveness of us versus them mentality. And believe me, like I said, I have been, I have been a very loud voice in policing. A previous police chief wanted to fire me because I said police are losing community support in 2017. And I actually said within the next three to five years, there's going to be a matchbox events that change policing in, in North America forever. And unfortunately, almost predictive of the murder of George Floyd. So I think we are at a time now way better than any other time in history based on the amount of people that have paid attention to what I call what is police reform, but I think needs to be evolution. Because I've heard the same arguments since 1991 with Rodney King, and I'm tired of the same old reform arguments. But I think if we have a group of people who have a, have a vision and a path and don't always agree, and I'm good with that, we can, we can disagree on that path on that journey. But at the same time, we need to really focus on community safety and well-being, and we need to focus on people, um, and we need to focus on how policing needs to be done in the future. And uh, to me, if or if policing needs to be done at all in the future, and if that's if it doesn't, what is the what is the alternative to that? What is the alternative to that? Because unfortunately, we are human beings, and let's be honest, the human race is nasty at times, and we hurt each other. And how do we stop? How do we? What do we do to address that? If it's if it's imagining something beyond our current system, which I totally and truly believe we need to, because when we look at the history of policing, both in Canada and Canada with the March West and the oppression of Indigenous populations, um, the U.S. more in relation to uh, slavery. Um, but both of them are built in systemic racist issues that we need to address in order to move forward. So I, my, I am obviously, I'm a little bit passionate about it because I've been in a system that I don't agree with. 
my, and I said in my previous presentation, some of my closest friends are people that I've incarcerated. Um, and that to me is those individuals have motivated my change. Um, and, you know, I heard in the previous thing that police become academics to prove they're right. Not always. Police sometimes become academics to prove the system wrong. And it's about how do we fix it? So that's just my two cents. Thank you, Dan. I mean, this, this raises a, a more general issue, which is that usually networks need some kind of guiding principles. So in, in New York, again, we're a coalition rather than a network. Ours are pretty tight and we, we approve people for membership. And, and those folks have to agree that they embrace the sort of core principles that guide our organizing. So I would think that an early task of such an initiative would be to establish basic ground rules, which might include how we want to relate to those in, in law enforcement in the criminal legal system, right? So that's not a decision we're going to make here, but that is a decision that would need to be made, I think. Yeah, so can I just add that that is going to be uh, the, some of the most important, hardest work and will take the most time and needs the most input. I, I, I Count me in. Yeah, yeah. Andrea? I, I would say I agree, even though I think we can, ha I really do think we can have the best of bo both worlds. We can have, we can have some kind of an auxiliary thing with law enforcement that has nothing to do with our strategizing and has nothing to do with, um, you know, the core, I mean, doesn't impinge, imp inappropriately impinge on the core of what we're doing, yet has all the benefits that Dan talked about, because I really do believe in those, uh, ben uh, in the benefits that uh, he talked about and that Colleen talked about. I think we can easily do both. But that's a discussion for the committee. All right, so uh, given the time, I think the next step is going to come from the conference organizers who have received some uh, requests to join them in the conversation. And uh, we've laid out some sense of the scope of the thing, the, the general organizational structure, right? And then the, the need for some next steps, uh, which I think is actually kind of exceeds my expectations for today. So, because there's only so much you can do in an hour and 15 minutes. So I wanna thank everyone for being so uh, responsible and, and for contributing so honestly and generously to, a, to a, such an important conversation. And uh, I, I wish everyone uh, all the best in trying to figure 